Hillel Fold is a global speaker, startup advisor, tech columnist. First and foremost, he's a proud Jew, proud father, proud husband, and a truly inspirational person whom I've been following for a long time, way before Simchas Torah, way before October 7th. Hillel, it is a real privilege to have you here, joining, spending your time. Thank you for having me. And it's our pleasure in many ways. I feel like you have become a spokesman for Call Yisrael. Uh, your posts on social media are having a profound impact uh, on public opinion, on shaping public opinion, world opinion amongst Jews and non-Jews alike. Did you ever imagine, did you ever imagine, and of course we don't, it's not pleasant that it comes about through tragedy, through crisis, but you're really becoming, to me, a global representative and a very, very positive force for Israel and for the Jews. I mean, you know, I, I would say that, um, you know, throughout my career, while my career was in technology and innovation, um, that was my vehicle. But the underlying goal of everything that I've always done is to promote Israel and the Jewish people. Uh, so now it's just a different, you know, a different vehicle. Uh, but, you know, it's something that I think I've always been dedicated to. Uh, but, you know, now it's a more direct thing as opposed to indirectly, uh, you know, promoting Israel through tech. Now I'm doing, you know, Israel advocacy, just direct uh you know, uh, Israel advocacy, Hasbara, as we say in Hebrew, um, no, no masks and no, uh, no barriers, just straight at it. But right, and it's incredible. And yeah, I guess those years of, like you're saying, you know, doing it, uh, using that vehicle for different messaging, but the, the the shift has been profound. And I don't even know how you do it. I mean, sometimes I I don't have enough energy to keep up sometimes with your tweets on social media. And uh, my mother, I had mentioned to you this in, in when we were in contact that uh, my mother keeps telling me, he'll have full telephone, you got to follow follow him. And uh, I told her I was interviewing you. She she was quite excited. Um, what's your opinion about uh, global opinion, uh, uh, how the globe has responded, the world has responded uh, to Israel? I'm, I'm curious if you're surprised. You know, there's been a lot of positive support. And uh, that's uh, even some unusual sources. There has been a tremendous amount of negativity so I can imagine one being surprised in either direction. So what are your thoughts about that? My thoughts are anyone who's surprised has not opened the history book. That's it. I mean, the script is already written. We, we keep seeing the same script over and over and over again. This is nothing new. I mean, you know, it happened in the Greek Empire. It happened in the Roman Empire. It happened in the Nazi Empire. It, had, it happened in ancient Egypt. It's the same story. You have a very powerful empire who, you know, grows and grows in in, in, in power and influence until the point that their their power and influence goes straight to their head, and then morality goes out the window. And when morality goes out the window, that society decides they don't want, you know, old school morality. They don't want the source of morality, which is the Torah. So they need to get rid of that Torah. How do they get rid of the Torah? They can't kill the person or the the entity that created the Torah. What they can do is get rid of the messenger, and we are the messengers. So you know, as soon as morality goes out the window, anti-Semitism spikes, and as soon as anti-Semitism spikes, uh, assimilation. You know, we, we do the same thing. We say, no, 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 Greeks, we're just like you. No, Romans, we're just like you. America, we're more liberal than you. We're the most liberal people in America. We're just like you. And then that empire say, you know, as, as, a, as a, I would say, as a, as a collective says to us, no, 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 you're not just like us. Let me show you. Let me show you that you're not just like us. We have this tool. We call it anti-Semitism. Let me show you that you're not just like us. And then, then it hits the fan. Uh, and so we know the script, you know, I, I think the only thing that su should surprise anyone is that anyone's standing by us at this point. Um, you know, it's just, it's the it's the oldest hatred in the world, the hatred of the Jews, just takes on a new mask in every generation. And this generation's mask is anti-Zionism, but it's the same old hatred. Very well said. I mean, I really appreciate your clarity there. And uh, yeah, direct, very direct and right to the point. And who could disagree? Who could argue? And especially in the framework of history, I mean, it, it's chilling, you know, when you put it that way, when you're as blunt as you're being, but that, which is what we love about you in general, I think is, uh, you know, your straight talk, but you're absolutely 100 percent right. And in that uh, on that note, what are you, what is your opinion about President Biden and uh, how the Biden administration has been reacting? And there have been some very good people. I think we would agree. John Kirby. I mean, I, I, he has been very, very positive. But overall, the Biden administration, what are your thoughts? So, uh, you know, I'm conflicted. I'm not really conflicted, but, you, you know, there, there's two, let's call it opposing uh, outlooks on this. On the one hand, you know, there's there's a concept of gratitude and Akara Satov. And, you know, relatively speaking, they've been, they've, they've had our backs and, you know, we have to be thankful for that, obviously. Having said that, uh, anybody who thinks that that love is unconditional or that they really, really have our backs versus they just have their own interests in, in mind uh, is, again, not paying attention. So, you know, whether it's going to happen tomorrow or in a week or in a month, eventually the Biden administration is going to say to Israel, that's it, enough, cease fire. And hopefully our leaders in Israel will have enough courage uh, to give Biden, uh, uh, raise a certain finger, you know, and uh, when that happens, 
you know, Biden's not going to be happy and that will be the end of that. And so, you know, this this relationship that we have with the United States that's lasted this long has been a beautiful relationship. But uh, I think we all know it's coming to an end. And so I don't know. Again, I don't know if it's happening tomorrow or in a week, but I have zero doubt whatsoever that that uh, support and love is conditional. And as soon as that condition uh, dissipates, the love will dissipate, and we will no longer have a relationship uh, with the Biden administration. I hope it. I hope it. Listen, I hope we could, you know, at least have the flexibility uh, to have their backs until we win the war. But I'm 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 skeptical. I'm not sure that that's what's going to happen. Yeah, th- absolutely. That's been my fear from day one. Is the question is how long they hold out, and obviously they're under enormous pressure, political pressure, pressure from voters, pressure from Muslim groups, pressure, money pressure, financial pressure. Now they feel it on both ends of the Biden administration. But uh, but but I totally agree with you. It's been my fear from day one is how long can it hang on? And and like you said, is there some point where Israel buckles under the pressure? They still haven't gotten that 14 billion dollars. They've been talking about it for months. They've been fighting about it. it's a political football where each politician is using it, exploiting it to get their own uh, agenda through their own you know narrative pass through. But um, which is which is d- d- disgraceful by itself in its own right. But uh, yeah, that's the fear is, uh, you know, number one, when does the shoe drop, like you say, and um, when did he, uh, what, you know, how well will the Israelis' response be? Because forgetting anything else, there's a lot of financial support is at, is at stake. And, and there were two recent stories, of course, uh, Bi- President Biden in that, in that fundraiser, he privately slammed the Israeli government. He recounted conversations with Netanyahu. He said very bizarre things, by the way, that uh, you're probably aware of. That, you know, he said that he told Bibi Netanyahu, we should not have gone into Afghanistan after 9-11. I mean, uh, I know Biden, you know, b- the cognitive uh, functioning is not all there, but that that that's pretty shocking. And uh, then there's a story in the Wall Street Journal this week that Biden's policies are directly endangering IDF soldiers. This to me was very, very frightening because it makes sense. The, the, there have has been an uptick in the amount of deaths that are happening, uh, which every every life is precious, every civilian life, certainly every soldier's life. I mean, the, the, these superhuman people had, you know, going into literally the, the this this war zone. And uh, supposedly the Israelis are not, according to, according to the Wall Street Journal, that the, the the Israelis are not able to clear out to use airstrikes because Biden's pressuring them to d- be more tactical, be more surgical in their strikes. And uh, that has led to more soldiers on the ground dying. Uh, did, did you see that? I did. And it's again, it's only a surprise to those who are not paying attention. That's it. I mean, <laughs> you know, the, the, I wrote a post this morning uh, with a long list of the I don't it, uh, about the laughable double standard. It's it's you gotta you can't help but laugh. You look at these these things and it's just like, where are your brains? Like, I, you know, and the list is long, but you know, it's just a it's just a crazy thing to see how the world completely lost its moral compass in you know in two months. Right? It took it took years in Germany to go from dangerous rhetoric to the extermination of Jews. Here it took two months and people are being beaten on the streets and. You know, we know, and you know what's going on. So, you know, it's a very scary situation. But I think, on the one hand, obviously, we very much need that. We don't need it. It makes our life easier when we have the financial backing from the United States. Um, but it also creates a codependency that is not healthy. And uh, you know, we're paying the price right now with dead soldiers. So, you know, I don't, I don't, I'm not a military strategist or a prime minister who's able to say we should just cut ties with the United States and and screw their money. I, I can't say that. I don't know if that's something that's even remotely realistic, but I do know that our dependency on the United States is long term, very, very damaging. Interesting. Wow, that's a very interesting take. And I totally think a lot of people would agree with you, especially now when uh, when when the, the stakes are higher than we've ever seen in our lifetime. Speaking of your of your tweets and of your posts, uh, there are X is now. I don't know what they call it, but uh, I still call it a tweet. You had a very, very interesting tweet, I believe, yesterday. Uh, I'll just read some excerpts over here. It was, it was two, and it, this really is like a microcosm of uh, almost this entire situation. 2 a.m. IDF soldiers noted suspicious movements in the horizon in a time of war. That would generally mean to open fire, but the IDF, being the IDF, walked to notice that it was a four-year-old girl walking aimlessly without shoes with multiple wounds. They took her to a field doctor, treated her wounds, helped her every way they could brought it to humanitarian corridor, and it turns out the child was sent by Hamas into the heart of the war zone to see if Israeli soldiers were up and alert. Their cruelty knows. I mean, it makes you just, it, it's so heartbreaking and, uh, you know, so incredibly moving, the story. And why don't you see the story in the in the press, quoting you here, good question. If there was ever a story that illustrates the endlessly savage nature of Hamas, deep and compassionate nature of the IDF, that is it. And 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 yet it just I mean, yesterday, yesterday, a director Beautiful of a hospital, yesterday, yeah. a director of a hospital in, uh, in Gaza, uh, admitted straight up that since 2010 he's been a Hamas terrorist and 
he admitted straight up openly that the, the hospital that he was the director of is being used as the Hamas terror base. It's reported nowhere. Like you will not see this anywhere. And it's video. I mean, it's a video interview. You could, you could watch the thing. The guy, nothing. Nobody reports it because you know. Again, like we know what gets clicks, and Jew hatred gets clicks. And if and if something you know does not align with a person's agenda or the person's narrative that Israel is the oppressor, then they just won't report it. And that's what's going on. It's just blatant lies and hypocrisy, and it's just it's terrible. Absolutely, absolutely. Very well said. Uh, I've, I've got to ask you about this, you know, horrific, this unspeakable tragedy that took place last week with, of course, the, the three hostages. I mean, it's just it's, it's unbearable. I mean, it's just it's hard to, to even utter the word. But the IDF, of course, mistakenly killed uh, three hostages and uh, Rahman Latlan. And, uh, you know, number one, uh, it, it, you know, the more details that emerge and it's horrific. I, I can't even imagine what the soldiers are going through. But, uh, you know, the, the more details that emerge, we see. The, the situation is, even as much as we sort of do understand it, that they're sitting there, they're surrounded by the enemy, surrounded by terrorists every single corner they turn. I don't care if their shirts are off. I don't care if they're not dressed and if they're waving a white flag. They are dangerous. And every there's booby trapped. So, uh, you know, the, obviously the soldiers here are not at fault at the same time. It, it's it's just so unthinkable. Now they're talking about, you know, communication failures. And um, I'm just curious what your response is and what your thoughts is and how you even cope with such a story. So... You know, for me, uh, on a personal level, um, given my background and and my personal uh, loss, you know, my brother was murdered uh, by Palestinian yeah. terrorists five years ago. And so, you know, terror, generally speaking, triggers the heck out of me. Like whenever there's an attack, it, it puts me into a very bad, dark place. And as you can imagine, October 7th, you know, it, it, like you said, unbearable, but unbearable, you know, exponentially more than any, any normal person. Um, and I... I only have one way of coping and, you know, it's a very simplistic way, maybe even a childish way, but I have to cope by saying to myself, you, you cannot look at this war through a human, logical, rational lens because there is no logic or rationale into anything that's happening in this war. The whole thing from beginning to end makes no sense. And so I have to just look up, to, you know, to my creator and say, I don't know why you're doing what you're doing. I, you know, I'm, I'm my, my, my finite brain cannot understand it. But I know that you're pulling the strings because there's no other way to look at this. There's no way I can explain any of this logically. And so I just have to say, I just don't understand it. It hurts, but I can't let myself, you know, go down that rabbit hole because it's it's never ending. So I just, you know, these things, I read them, I, I, I mourn, you know, I feel the pain, but I have to go on because it's just, it's impossible otherwise. Wow. Yeah. I'm not completely understand that. I'm glad I was going to bring up, you know, of course, your brother and Allah Shalom, Allah Bracha. And uh, yeah, what a hero that he was, and uh, that's that's really interesting how you're describing because it, it's it's a trauma. Here I am on the other side of the world, and uh, obviously Jews are in are, are in pain and suffering, and the trauma was affecting all of us. But uh, yeah, I'm sure that uh, it's hard to imagine what you go through and what you and you know how you get triggered and uh, very very un understandable. Again, as much as anyone can understand, not in the, those shoes. Uh, do you have, and this is totally shifting gears here. I don't know how involved you are. Like you mentioned, you know we're not military strategists, and we don't know. Uh, all the, you know, geo uh, political uh, issues. But uh, like you have the two leaders of Hamas, these two billionaires sitting there in Qatar, you know, number one, Qatar gets away, you know, literally with murder and, uh, you know, housing these people, protecting these people, Kali Mishal, Ismail Haniya and others, billionaires. And, you know, they, they, they throw all these little people to die and then they're walking, laughing all the way to the bank and literally have billions and billions of dollars. Um, why on earth does Israel not assassinate these people? Well, again, uh, you know, asterisk, I don't know. <laughs> Start with that. I don't know. Um, I do know that that's, you know, a top priority. Um, but, you know, let's not forget that America took 10 years to get bin Laden, right? So, you know, it's going to happen. I don't think anybody has any doubt about the fact that Ismail Aniyah is a dead man walking. Uh, and so is uh, the other dude, uh, Sinwar. Uh, you know, they know it. We know it. Everyone knows it. The question is when. Uh, it has to be done strategically. It has to be done at the right time. It's not as easy as it seems. And, you know, I know the Mossad is like, uh, you know, this uh, synonymous word with super superheroes. But at the end of the day, you know, it has to be done in the right uh, time in the right way. And so I know that, you know, many of these were that many of these leaders were actually kicked out of Qatar because they could not, you know, ensure their safety. And, uh, you know, we know where they are. You know, the Israeli intelligence knows exactly where they are at all times. And there's no question that it's going to happen and hopefully sooner than later. Okay, so you think it's only a matter of time. I mean, and you're right about Bin Laden. I knew 
you know, uh, there was debate how, how soon it would happen. I assumed that, you know, he, he knew how to hide. These people are, are, you know, quite intelligent, quite strategic and, 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 and they're not exactly out there in Times Square. I get that. But, uh, but you think that Israel's doing anything it can. It sounds like you don't think that, uh, for whatever reason, they're trying to uh, avoid that. Again, I, I don't have the any right. intel to tell you, but I, but I would, if I, you know, if, if I had to guess, I would guess that this is one of the top priorities, not only because we have to get rid of, you know, these, the, the, you know, these, these, these crazy terrorists, but because it's, it's going to destroy the morale of Hamas. It's going to be the beginning of the end, or it's already, we're already at the beginning of the end, but it's going to be a big step forward towards the end of Hamas. So it is a very important priority of the state of Israel. That's for sure. Uh, you know, let's, uh, let's hope it happens soon. Yeah. All right. A final question before I ask you a little bit about your business and your personal uh, things going on. Uh, the Red Cross, it, 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 I mean, I talk about, you know, disgraceful hypocrites, the Red Cross, it's just, it's unbelievable. And they, I mean, clearly have been exposed as total phonies. And uh, and, and it's amazing that there's not more pressure, there, you know, there, there's not more world pressure on the Red Cross and the Red Cross themselves, uh, you know, have done, like, like they call them a taxi cab service. I mean, uh, that that's really what it's all about. And I'm sure you're not surprised based on everything that you're saying right now, but, uh, but, but it, it's just like mind boggling. It isn't, but it is not mind boggling. That's the thing. It's only mind boggling if you're not paying attention, right? Again, look at history, man. This is these these organizations. Like, you can't we can't depend on these organizations. The second we, we need them for anything, they they stab us in the back time and time again. The Red Cross could not care less. You know, I, I don't know if you saw someone called uh, the uh, UNRWA offices yesterday uh, and asked for funds for Israeli, uh, you know, uh, families or whatever. And they're like, oh, we don't have, you know, we don't have funds for only have funds for Palestinians. Like literally, that's what they said on the phone. You know, the level of hypocrisy, the level of Jew hatred wow. out there is just staggering, but unsurprising in any way, shape or form. You just have to read history books. I mean, and by the way, you know, when you read history books, you're not only going to learn about how much the world hates the Jews. You're also going to learn about how stupid we are as a nation time and time again. I mean, go back to, you know, ancient Egypt. Like we we know this because we, you know, we learned Torah our whole lives, but did you ever stop to think about the fact that after everything Hashem did for the Jewish people in Egypt, after the 10 plagues, after everything, 80% stayed back? Like, do, you, do you understand, like, what is wrong with us? Like, you know, in, in the desert, God is doing these insane miracles. And he says, go into the land. What do we do? We send spies? What is wrong with us? We don't see what's in front of us. We don't learn from history. We don't recognize when God is yelling at us in a good way and throwing miracles and doing things. You know, even today, these, this war, it's miracle after miracle after miracle. We just don't see it because we're we are just, I don't know, we're blind or something. It's, it's a crazy thing to see. But most people don't know how to open a history book, which is just, you know, it's unfortunate. I love it. I love your clarity. I love your wisdom. I mean, this is why, you know, you're gaining a huge following. I don't know if you resolved. I know you had some issue with Twitter either being shadow banned or your, your engagement was down. But uh, you have this incredible, incredible way of piercing through all the clutter, all the junk. And, you know, and which I'm sure is, is, is a big part of your success in, 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 in the business world. And let's get to that. I, you know, I believe you were named Israel's top marketer. And uh, if you don't mind telling us a little bit, I'm, you know, I'm familiar with digital marketing world. Like I said, I've been following you well before this whole current situation. And, uh, you know, I'm amazed. I mean, even speaking with you now, and I know this is, uh, you know, not your, let's call it first comfort zone in the sense that, you know, you, you, this is not, we're not having a business conversation. We're talking about politics. In other words, that, that's call it your side hobby. And uh, still you just have this very, very dynamic uh, clarity and just an incredible uh, skill with communication. I'm curious, number one, you know, how you manage to, to juggle everything you're doing and the family, Baruch Hashem, and, uh, you know, how you've been able to kind of, uh, meld the two worlds together and tell us just a little bit about like what you do on a day-to-day -day basis if you can. Sure. So first of all, uh, again, I don't think what I'm doing now fundamentally is a shift. At the end of the day, it's Israel, right? That's what I've always done. And that's what I'm continuing to do. It's just now it's more direct. Um, but as far as time, um, you know, I, I optimize the heck out of my time. Like I have, I basically built like an operating system of time optimization hacks, like so many different things that I do, you know, that just saves me countless hours throughout the day. Uh, you know, I try very hard not to waste time uh, when it comes to getting stuff done. Um, so that's, you know, in terms of that, but my, my day to day, I mean, pre-war was, you know, I wake up, uh, I live in Beit Shemesh, five kids. I wake up, let's say 6 a.m., uh, have coffee with the wife, play a little Wordle. <laughs> um, and uh, then I, you know, pray to my creator and, uh, you know, post about that because that's yeah. important to inspire people. And yes. then I had usually, again, before the war, I would head out to Tel Aviv and basically sit in a cafe, um, 
you know, from let's call it 9 a.m. till about 4 p.m. Uh, back to back meetings with entrepreneurs who come to me, you know, want advice or whatever it may be. Um, and many of those entrepreneurs then eventually, ultimately come back to me, uh, sometimes even a decade later and say to me, you know, you helped us back then. Uh, we'd love to work with you in a formal capacity. And so I built this, uh, you know, portfolio of companies that I work with on helping them grow. Um, and yeah, just get to meet the most remarkable people every day. And I feel extremely fortunate and sort of like a kid in a candy store. Wow, that is amazing. Now, a couple of quick questions. Number one, a cafe. You're not doing it in some in some fancy plush office. You're doing actually you're meeting them in a cafe. Uh, I am. That, that, that's that's really interesting. And uh, why? Why? In other words, why is that? Why that more as opposed to a formal setting? I mean, I, I don't see any any particular reason to rent an office when I'm sitting in a cafe in the middle of Tel Aviv and the entire tech world goes through this cafe on a daily basis. So if you sit there, you meet like the most unbelievable people. So I sit there, That's they true. know me in the cafe, they took good, take good care of me. You know, I have uh, I have my, my normal stuff that I order, whatever. And uh, yeah, it works. It's just very convenient. There's parking everywhere. It's, just, it's convenient. Easy. Wow. And, and if I can ask, uh, I mean, the, the way you described it, are you literally having like a free consultation with this, like th that initial meeting you're describing? You're not charging them later on the line? You're hoping to, is that how that no, works? No, it's a... Uh... It's my whole it's my whole business philosophy. And I think, you know, I'm not I'm not the first to talk about this. I didn't make it up, but um the world has to start understanding that business is not a zero sum game, right? People view business as zero sum. So if I give you money, I must be losing money. But that's that's just not the case. And most people don't understand it. But as you know, I mean you've heard this analogy a thousand times in your life, I'm sure. The way I view business is like a candle, right? A candle gives its fire, it loses nothing, right? Just get, it creates more fire in the world. And so when I sit with an entrepreneur and I can help them with an introduction to whoever or some advice on whatever, you know, they buy me a cup of coffee. It's as we say in the in the world of Talmud, uh, I lost nothing. They gained, I lost nothing. Um, having said that, from a purely, let's call it cynical perspective, if I want to look at this in, in a, you know, purely business, you know, instead of being like everyone else who makes a promise and then monetizes on that promise and then hopefully delivers, I flip the order and I deliver real value. And then the company comes back to me and then we talk about monetization. It's just a better model. You know, like if I, yeah. if I come to you and I say to you, you know, I'm going to do whatever for you. I'm going to get you press, right? Pay me. You're, you're, you're paying me for something you didn't even get yet. You're paying me, you know, on credit. Hopefully I'm going to deliver, which means that now we need to negotiate because, you know, I haven't done anything yet. Whereas if I show you what I can do for you and now you realize you need me, there's no negotiation, right? It's, I, I have, you need me. I don't need you. So, you know, that's my whole kind of business philosophy and it, and it works, it scales, it works. And I don't know why many people, I don't know why not enough people have replicated it because I scream it from the rooftops, so, you know, as much as I can, no one listens. I don't know. Right, you're living proof. I mean, it's not like, you know, this is some theory. I mean, this is a uh, proven concept, obviously, for many times over. All right, I, this this discussion, I'm blown away. I, I, as much as I've seen you, you know, I've been following you for a long time, but I've seen you do other interviews, but like having it face-to-face -face over here and uh, your whole philosophy, your whole approach to life, your clarity, like I said, your wisdom is phenomenal. The time optimization, there's so many takeaways. I'm going to go back and like Chazer and like review, but uh, time optimization hacks. I, I, I've literally been saying to myself, how on earth do you juggle that Baruch Hashem, family, everything that you do, and then this whole you know side thing, I understand it's the same fundamental concept, but it takes up a lot of your time. And uh, that explains it, you know, without getting into the details of the hacks, but that was, it's like the only way. I'm no, I'll give, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll just give, yeah. you, I'll give you I'll listeners please. just one example. Yes. I'm assuming most of your viewers, most of your listeners are using an iPhone. There's <laughs> yeah. a feature on iPhone that 99.9% .9 of iPhone users don't know exists. You go into settings, you go into general, you go into keyboard, and you go into text replacements. And text replacements are the ability to add a word or a letter and have the phone complete an entire sentence or an entire paragraph. So instead of me writing out my email address a thousand times a day, I set up a shortcut. Instead of me writing my phone number a thousand times a day, I set up a shortcut. Instead of me writing my bio, when someone says, oh, you know, I want to, you know, come speak, send me your bio. So well, I go into Google Drive, find the document, copy it, pay, like that's not efficient. That's not time, you know? So I set up a shortcut. So that feature, and then right there, that in and of itself saves me I have hours every day and most people don't even know it exists so like that right there is an amazing hack even though it's not a hack it's a, it's a feature in the iphone um <laughs> but you know that's just one layer then then i add another layer onto that which is you know i write for all these publications so i said to myself you know every time an entrepreneur does something quote unquote wrong makes a mistake and i need to now explain to that person why that is not the right way to do it instead of explaining it every time i just wrote an article about it and now 
when that person makes a mistake, I just send them the article. So I have a shortcut set up saying, hey, don't do it that way. Do it this way. Read this article. And so I write wow. one word and it fills an entire paragraph with a link to an article that I wrote. It saves me hours, like hours upon hours. So these are just some examples of things that I, I do to optimize my time. Right. A lot of the redundancies, you don't have to be like super organized. You don't have to be super structured, whether you are or you're not, but that's a great. And, and by the way, typing, typing, especially on my phone, it drives me crazy because I just feel like it's literally the biggest waste of time. Sometimes, obviously, you got, you got to send text, you got to whatever, but uh, it just it takes up so much time. <laughs> that's amazing. I, I type uh, I type supernaturally fast on my phone. I, I don't use computers, by the way. All of the, uh, you know, all of the uh, articles and everything that I do is all on my phone. I, never, wow. I almost never use a computer. Wow. All right. Because I'm where where the age. I mean, you know, the iPhones. I'm about the same age as you. And like the iPhones, you know, we were not. We didn't grow up with it in the cradle. And uh, you know, like uh, I, I'm still a keyboard guy. But that's really cool. That is really cool. All right. This has been amazing. All right. We'll leave it there. Hello, fold fold global speaker startup. Uh, Thank you.